Welcome well, Steve- to episode four of the new athletic supporters. We're already talking and barking up a storm here. So why don't we get right into it? I don't want to lose any of the listeners today. So I'm going to start at the very top talking about something we've never talked about before, because when anybody hears Tim Burgess talk, everybody pays attention. So Tim, why don't you fill us in on what you want to talk about regarding cricket? Okay, there was a, I, I will. Thank you for that intro, Steve. Um, I hope that nobody drops off to sleep while I'm talking about cricket. But quite a significant thing happened in uh, in England in the uh, in the first class, as they call it, you know, the professional league in uh, in England last week. Um, let me give you a bit of background uh, for those of you who are not well versed in cricket. There's a, and this is probably a conversation we can do, delve into more at another time, but. A lot of the the basic challenge of cricket is very like baseball. You know, you hit a ball, you catch a ball, you run, you know, you throw a ball. Most of the things are broadly similar. There are actually a lot more direct similarities than that, which we can come to another day. Um, But obviously there are a lot of things that are different. One of the different things is that if you hit the ball, you don't have to run. And you can hit the ball in any direction. Right, the bat, the batter is right in the middle of the field and can hit in any direction. Um, one of the other things that is different, which is relevant to the story that I'm eventually going to tell, um, is that the the boundary, the edge of the field, is not as far away as it is in baseball. Um, it's about 75 meters from what the batter to the to the edge of the field. Um, I think that works out to, what's that, 230, 240 feet, something like that, so that sort of order of magnitude, uh, which obviously is smaller, um, a shorter distance than from the home plate to, um, you know, to the fence uh, in most fields anyway. Um, and so to hit a home run is a more difficult thing than to hit it over the boundary in cricket. Having said that, <clears throat> what happened last week was that um, – a very fine player who has actually just been made captain of the England cricket team, which is, I would say, is the greatest honour in uh, in professional cricket, although Australians might disagree with me. They might think that captaining the Australian side is a great honour, but they're wrong. So we'll move past that. Um, he's just been made captain of the England cricket team. And last week, playing for his county, Durham, <clears throat> he pulled off a feat where he hit... Um, when you in cricket, when you hit it in the air over the boundary, just like a home run, you get six runs for it. Again, there's a lot of reasons why it's six runs. We'll get into that at another day when we talk about cricket more. But it's easier to do than it is in baseball. But it's not a simple or easy thing to do. And the England cricketer, England cricket captain, last Friday, hit five of them in a row. Is that what's called an, an over, Tim? Uh, six six balls is an over. So when when they pitch or bowler throw, uh, throws the ball down, he throws it down six times in a row, and then they go to the other end and do it from the other end. So you, you only have six in a block. You have six balls, and then you have another six balls and another six balls. Well, the England cricket captain playing for Durham, he hit the first five of them in a row in the air over the boundary. He basically hit five home runs off five pitches. Wow. Didn't leave anything, wow. that didn't, you know, five in a row. The, the <laughs> last one, he hit and it bounced once before it went over the fence. Has this ever happened before? Well, six in a row has happened twice. I think it happened in the, I forget the exact date, but like 1963, I think, and 1985. It's the only time in professional cricket that it's ever happened six in a row. So twice in all of professional cricket, it's happened six in a row. And he hit five in a row and almost got six in a row. So it was an exciting event in the um, in the world of cricket. And, uh, you know, those of you who don't follow cricket too much probably find it very hard to believe there's any exciting events in cricket. But actually, there are from time to time, there are exciting events. And that was one of them. So, yeah, it's a really it's quite a big deal. First time in many, many decades. Yeah. First time in many decades. I mean, the, the other two times it's been done six times in a row. Um, but this was five in a row, five and three quarters in a row. Um, and that's uh, that's really quite something. Really, uh, did they, very, did they uh, end up winning? Impressive. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the game's still going on. 
It's not yeah, I over. I don't, I don't know, but his his oh, rate of scoring for the whole the whole match was extremely high. He, I think he, he he scored 100 runs in about 60, 60 pitches coming at him. He scored 100 runs. Wow. But I mean, you know, if you have a have a sequence like that, right? You, he scored 34 runs off six pitches. So that's pretty good. Kim, why don't we switch over to baseball and you can tell us about whatever the ball controversy is. You know, the five of us have had ball controversies ourselves over the years. <laughs> well, as I, as I may have mentioned, uh, uh, offense is way down in baseball, not just a bit down, but way down. And so, of course, uh, all the prognosticators are wondering why. And there is a consensus Um supported by more than a few scholarly articles and some uh, some commentary from the players that the balls are absolutely different. The only thing I want to add to that is, is this uh, observation, which I consider ironic. Baseball is the sport that, that introduced the whole concept of advanced metrics, starting with rotisserie baseball in the early 80s. Um, it certainly... Uh, has uh, ad advanced and grown from there. It's now has saturated every sport. So I find it highly ironic that the sport that is all about math and advanced metrics and uh, calculations up the wazoo cannot consistently manufacture a baseball the same way from year to year in order to generate a, con a consistent output. One year, uh, offense is way up. The next year, it's average. The next year, this year, it's in the toilet. Anyway, there are very, very few runs being scored, and a lot of thirty million dollar players with uh, with offensive lines that are, uh, frankly, an embarrassment. Why can't they? Well, that, that, that's a really good question. I, I don't have a good answer for you there. Um, Perhaps I'll do some research and we can revisit that in another episode, Steve. Yeah. Did I not read that Major League Baseball owns the company that manufactures the baseballs, Kim, in which case they could tinker? Uh, you know, Kev, I should know that. And, and I, I can't definitively say whether you're right or wrong, but, but what, what, irrespective of, of that, uh, they, they absolutely have all kinds of influence on it. Um, and that, that that's part of the intrigue that there there are people out there who who think that uh, MLB is intentionally uh, messing with the balls for whatever purpose. It's all part of the the swirling controversy. Sure, the conspiracy theories that exactly. go on. Exactly. It, they would want some consistency from year to year. Hundred percent makes hey, sense. Buddy, so, the the, the owners can owners can save money by uh, the guys not hitting their levels for you know home runs and you know on base percentage where their bonuses kick in gee i don't know what happened bob hey, hey steve when we were speaking there a thought popped into my head um uh are golfers this generation of golfers are they bigger and stronger and driving the ball further than ever the way uh baseball pitchers are bigger and stronger and throwing harder than ever the short answer is yes, um, but it's also a combination of the equipment has changed significantly. The balls fly further. The club head of the driver specifically and the other clubs in general are larger. So there's a larger um, center of, you know, yeah. you know, sweet spot. Yeah. And it's the same in hockey as well. The guys are bigger and stronger and trained better, sure. but the equipment uh, changes the whole perspective on on how hard they shoot and and how accurate they're shooting and how they can uh, play with the puck as well. So I think it just transcends all sports in many ways. Probably right. right. It does. I mean, ten tennis has gone through a very similar thing, right? Yeah. With with certainly with the players getting much fitter and stronger, but with much bigger racket heads. When they were made of wood, you couldn't make a racket head that big. And now they're, they're composites and various things like that. They're, the racket heads are bigger, which gives a bigger sweet spot, which makes it easier to hit the ball faster. Fair. And, a, and soccer, interestingly enough, one of the biggest sports in the world has not gone through that. There's been really very little change. I mean, they still wear T-shirts, shorts, you know, boots with cleats, maybe a little lighter nowadays, but the ball is basically the same as it's been for 
decade. Um, Kev, why don't we talk about the NHL playoffs a little bit? You can tell us about the playoffs, what you think the playoff surprises are, and and then let's you know kind of ease into this Leaf Tampa Bay series that's turning into <laughs> a pretty interesting series. Sure. Well, as as I've always felt this way that the first round is always full of surprises and, and it's uh, no different this time around. But I think the thing that's really surprising is the wide variance in the scores. You just look at the first four games of the, of the Maple Leaf uh, lightning um, series and, you know, five, nothing Toronto, five, three Tampa, five, two Toronto, seven, three Tampa. Now some of that skewed a little bit because of some empty net goals and things too, but just widely varying for two, fairly closely matched teams as well. And there's a number of series that are actually the same way. So it's, it's been really fun to watch. It's frustrating as a, a Toronto Maple Leaf fan to watch because you, you know, you, you go in hoping that they're going to uh, go to sweep them in four. Well, that's not going to happen, but it's, it's uh, coming down to the wire and we'll see what happens over the next little while. But if I can just veer off ever so slightly for a second, there's a lot going on right now in the sport as, as teams that are eliminated are starting to make their changes and we see that uh, coaches are, are being excised. So, for example, the New York Islanders just let Barry Trotz go. And, and so there's a number of teams who are going to be looking for, for coaches over the next little while. New York Islanders, Detroit Red Wings, Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, there are several teams that have interim coaches who you hope that they're going to uh, lock them in like Montreal has done with Martin St. Louis. But uh, Winnipeg Jets have an interim coach. Florida Panthers do as well. Uh, Chicago Blackhawks. I can't imagine that Florida is going to make a change after finishing first overall through the course of the season. But nevertheless, there could be a whole lot of action. And you wonder if you, you hope that there's some new blood that comes in, but you wonder if some of the old stalwarts we, we have heard about through the years, but ne haven't necessarily seen them as well. Um, Mike Babcock, does he return? John Tortorella, possibly. We'll see. Uh, Claude Julian. Joel Quinville, after his, his challenges in Chicago, although he was coaching with Florida at the time, um, being privy to the whole, whole uh, situation that they had there with Beach. So, so we'll see if any of those guys return. We'll see if there's some new blood that comes in, which would be a good thing for the league as well. But there's a, a whole uh, renaissance going on in the game right now as the playoffs uh, unfold. So we'll see what happens in the next little while. It just makes it really interesting. Hey, Kev. Yeah. Uh, Carolina and Boston. C Carolina wiped the floor with Boston during the regular season, beat them three times, beat them badly, beat them in the first two games of the season of the series. And I, I, honestly, I was shocked to see Boston come back with uh, uh, with two wins granted in Boston. What, what, what do you make of the rest of that series? Well, part of it is that Frederick Anderson was the goaltender through the course of the regular season. He's out injured right now. So they're going with their second tier goalie, although he's a very good goaltender at that as well. Boston knows how to win, that's for sure. And, and uh, they're showing it right now. A lot of penalties in the, in, uh, the games over the weekend. That uh, certainly changed complexion. Brad Marchant is uh, Marchant, I guess. I got to be so careful with the name here. No, no he's he... Marchant. He's Marchant. There we are. He's not uh, a Marchant. He... He had a five-point game on, on the weekend. Uh, they won, what was it, 5-3 at that point. He's, he's on fire right now, even though he's the most hated guy in the league. He's a guy that you'd love to have on your team, or at least theoretically. So it's, they've made it a really interesting series, but Carolina certainly would be one of the surprises of the playoffs. Wouldn't have expected that, uh, that Boston would have been able to put up the fight that they've put and, and made it a series at this point. So... See what happens. It it's, makes it really fun to watch, but boy, oh boy, it's uh, been interesting. Ian, you claim that there's something interesting happening in the Premier League. So enter, <laughs> entertain us. Like, like, remember, we're, you know, we're, we're a good 20 minutes or so into this podcast, so we're losing listeners. So this is really important for you to like really, you know, bring your game. <laughs> well, I was, you know, I mean, I was, I was hoping to get this segue that you know the Habs have set another record for themselves we're not going to talk about the Habs this episode but they're the first team to ever finish 32nd in the league I mean come on the first <laughs> for them the the, the the Premier League is is 
a lot of excitement going on right now. Um, in the, in the, the title, the title's now changed. Uh, Tottenham drew with Liverpool 1-1, so that ends Liverpool's chances of winning the title. Man City, who won the Premier League four years in a row, they haven't won the Champions League title, which is where the champions of all the major leagues play in a tournament. They lost again this week against the, to Real Madrid. It's crazy. Everton, who were risking of dropping down to the championship last week, have now rescued themselves with a very solid win. They've got a game in hand, and it looks like they aren't going to drop down into the championship. But the real news this week, and it's not quite about the Prem, but it's potentially for the Prem for next year, is a team close to my heart and close to a friend of Tim's heart, Luton Town. Luton Town is a suburb of London. It's the, uh, the Luton Airport is where many of the uh, all-inclusive travel uh, flights fly out of. They've got a lovely stadium that holds about, I don't know, 10 or 11,000. You are literally right on top of the pitch when you're there watching. I've had the pleasure of being there. Andrew and I got to go when we were in London a number of years ago. Luton Town, in the last 10 years, have gone from the 11th place in the Conference League and basically ranked about 103rd in all of the all of the professional teams in England to this year sixth in the championship, which is one level below the um, the Premier League and 27th best in all of England. And wow. if they if they uh, win in the tournament that, that that they've got to play in to advance to become one of the three moving up from the championship, they've got a chance to get back in the Premier League for the first time in decades. But it's just, it's incredible to watch that over those 10 years and all, you know, you know, 103rd, 99, 93rd, 76, 72nd, 70th, 45th, 39th, 32nd. So they, this tiny little town with this amazing fans um, and this fantastic coach in Nathan Jones, who was able to draw the best out of every one of his players have taken this team, like I say, in 10 years from way out of it to they're on the doorstep. They're knocking on the door to get in the Premier League. And if they get up there, it's going to be amazing. They'll be the, the team with the smallest stadium in the Prem and the biggest hearts and the great, some of the greatest fans. That's my story. And it's, it's one of those Cinderella-type stories. It, it's, a great, it's a great story, Ian. I, I, I love that. I mean, that's, that's where... That's where Barnsley were last year, almost but not quite. So uh, I hope for better for Luton than Barnsley. I will. I will go crazy if if Luton make it up. I will. I will wear my Luton Town hat every day the, on a, every Saturday I go out. It is just. It's so great. It's like I say. It's the the. It's to to, to be at a pitch like I mean I've been to the big stadiums here. I've been to where Manchester United play, and it's it's like even in the decent rows, you're a million miles away, but. At Luton Town, almost every seat you're right on top of it, and it's just it's fantastic. And there are people like this friend of Tim's and mine. She's been on, she's had season tickets since she was eight. She's now probably fifty something, is my guess. Um, I'll ask her when she comes in the, the summertime. She's coming over in July, so we're gonna hang out a bit. But yeah, so just it's it's one of those really great stories in in, in soccer. And one of the things you love about the fact that teams can move up and move down within the league as they play, which, you know, with hockey, once you get in the, in the big leagues, you're there, whether you're really good or really bad. Tim, we want to talk about the weekend at all and, and what Miami might, might mean to F1 in North America. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, the, the, as we talked about a, a couple of episodes ago, I think, um, Miami this is the first time they've, they've raced in Miami. It is now the second regular um, race in, in the U.S. Um, alongside um, Austin, um, where they've been racing for some time. Uh, they used to race it. They've raced in various places, but the Austin race has been quite solid for a while. Um, Miami joined this year and next year. I think it's next year. Might be the year after. But I think next year, Vegas is also going to have a Grand Prix. Um, but by all accounts, and certainly from watching it on TV, the Miami race, or at least the build-up to the Miami race, was completely bananas. Frankly, it was bananas. I mean, that the, the photo there—you you, know—you've got you've got Lewis Hamilton, seven-time world champion. 
you've got Michael Jordan, um, Dave Beckham, and uh, I can't remember the NFL player's name. Tom Brady. Tom Brady. Tom Brady. Thanks. Yeah. The uh, you know what is he seven time uh, um, um, Super Bowl Super champ. Bowl champ as well. So you know those guys were all together um, in Miami. But there's a weird and wonderful thing about Formula One. Um, it's, I don't think this has always been true in history, but it's certainly been true for many years now, is that many celebrities and other sporting stars, plus a whole bunch of journalists and, and uh, team members and, and so on, mill about on the starting grid on the track right up until about 10 minutes before the race starts. So all the cars are there. All the drivers are trying to get ready. The teams are trying to, pre- you know, do the last coaching of the drivers and get them in the right headspace and all the stuff that top sportsmen do. And there's there's about six million celebrities milling around all all over the place. And cameras and journalists trying to do interviews of, <laughs> with with every single one of them. Yeah, and half of them don't want to talk to the press at all. So I'm not quite sure why they're there. Um, and I would say. I would say probably a good third of them don't know anything about racing, right? So they don't know anything about racing, but they're just there to be seen at this massive event. And Miami was a ridiculously massive event. You know, it was, it was so much razzmatazz. There were so many celebrities. There were so many other great sports people there. Um, you know, the, the Williams sisters were on the grid and, Basketball players were on the grid, and Tom Brady had this big thing with Lewis Hamilton before the before the weekend. It was it was nuts, frankly. It was genuinely nuts. Uh, and um, there's a guy who works for Sky TV in the UK um, who, 25 years ago, started doing what he calls the grid walk. And it, it, they kind of never really done this sort of thing before. But he said, "I'm going to go down there with all these crazy people on the grid." in that last half hour before the race starts. And I'm going to walk up and down. And I'm going to start interviewing the drivers and the team members and, you know, and see how everyone's doing. And because he is an ex-driver, he kind of gets away with shoving his microphone under a driver's nose when they really don't want to talk to anybody because, you know, he's he's been there and he's done it. Um, but he also interviews when he can. He interviews the celebrities or they, you know, there's great sports people from other, other um, disciplines. And he had a hilarious grid walk on on Sunday where he just he talked to all sorts of people, most of whom he had no idea who they were, (laughs) you know, and he just goes, you look famous. Who are you? You know, (laughs) so it was was genuinely it was a very, very funny bit of TV. It was a very funny bit of TV. But one of the things, you know, the the thing that I, I genuinely find amazing is, you know, you imagine this in hockey or baseball or something like that. Right. The guys are out there doing their warm up. And I don't know, 10 times as many people not involved in the game are on the, on the playing surface at the same time. Imagine that with the, with the hockey players warming up before the game. And you've got like, I don't know, 60 other people in skates just wandering about skating in and bumping into things and falling over because they don't know what they're doing. You that's know, called the that's escapades. That's the equivalent of what this is. That's the equivalent of it. It's one totally of the, nuts. What, Miami was, was the more nuts I've ever seen. It, it was... I, I, it was hilarious. It was pure comedy gold. Yeah. Um, there's just no doubt about it. It, it was, there, there were two things that I loved about it. One is this gentleman, Martin Brendel, the interviewer for Sky Sport, would throw his microphone in front of someone and say, hi, I'm Martin Brendel from Sky Sport. They'd look at him like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> it, was so, it was so hilarious. And then, oh. and then there'd be these other people like Tim was mentioning that you know he's chasing people. I don't, I don't know who this guy is, but I put the microphone in front of him, trying to find out if he's famous or not. And it was just yeah. it was it was I know it's it's ten or fifteen minutes before the race starts, and like Tim says, it was just crazy. It was just purely hilarious as as yeah. a fan who's watching it. Just because you know you so often see those setups where you know someone's out interviewing and. Obviously, someone said, up, okay, in his ears, like, okay, you're about to enter Tim Burgess from Tapal. You know, hi, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, he just, he's all on his lonesome there with a microphone trying to interview anybody and everybody and having no idea who they were and them having no idea who he is because they're just celebrities wandering around this thing in Miami for the first time. They have no idea that this, that, you know, they probably assume the race is being shown somewhere, but have no idea who this Martin Brundle is or what Sky Sports is because it's probably Sky Sports I don't think is even in America. It was great. 
Um, it was it was very funny. And at the end of all that, there was a race, actually. They did, they did get everybody off the grid and they did start the race and it was fine. Yeah. So, Kim, um, do you want to talk about the Jays, expectations and reality? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say I told you so. A few weeks ago, I was talking about how irritated I was with the, the never-ending, uh, uh, um, I guess it's a marketing assault of how great we're going to be and how good we are and so on and so forth. In the back of my head, uh, the, the thought was, you got to still play 162 games, guys, and there's going to be a regression to the mean. Um, different things are going to happen, and unfortunately, it's turning out that way. They're not hitting well at all as a team. Um, a bunch of guys have particularly terrible numbers. Um, even uh, the vaunted Vlad, his numbers are good, but not quite to last year's uh, level. Now, that said, it is true that uh, the loss of Tay Oscar and Danny Jansen really hurt. We just got Tay Oscar back. Danny's right around the corner. They cannot run uh, Tapia and Zimmer out on a on a day by day basis. They are not uh, everyday major league ball players. They are role players. Um, so they've got to get that uh, that offense started. They lost three out of four to Cleveland uh, on the weekend. Very very disappointing. On the other side of the coin, Kevin Gaussman might be the best pitcher in the American League League right now. If you missed it, he went 141 batters before he walked his first batter this year. That is just an unbelievable stat. So hats off to the Jays. The Gaussman signing so far is looking amazing. Well, that's it, kids. That's a wrap-up of Episode 4 of the New Athletic Supporters. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. We're on Apple Podcasts now, as well as Spotify and YouTube, so please rate and review the podcast and share it with all your friends. If you've made it this far and you're keeping a sticker book, please add a raspberry sticker. Thanks again for listening, because now you too are a New Athletic Supporter.